the sheets back there and pass out anybody. It's uh, part four, love, spirit, and Christ filling. And we're going to be in Ephesians, book of Ephesians chapter one, in just about one minute. Good morning. Good morning. We are delighted that you're with us today. We're in a series of studies on fulfilling your potential for Christ. And before we proceed, why don't we pause and ask the Lord's blessing on this time. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to spend time in the Word of God, to be refreshed and challenged and encouraged. And we would ask that the Spirit of God would guide us and direct us today. Uh, as we look at these truths, help us to see them as, as more than just intellectual things, as abstract concepts, but as genuine truth that is designed to build us up and to make us more like Jesus Christ. And so give to us, we pray, understanding and then application, uh, that we would take these things to heart, that we would apply them and obey them and use them in our lives. We ask your blessing upon every aspect of the day, that Jesus Christ would be exalted uh, and that we would be uh, that we would have great joy and uh, great edification together today. We thank you for all who are here. We pray for those who cannot be with us. We pray as well for our live stream ministry that those joining us might be blessed and encouraged. So, Father, we thank you for this time and ask your help. In Jesus' name, amen. Ephesians chapter 1. Let me review with you for a moment where we have been and what we're going to do today. We have been looking at this concept of fulfilling your potential for Christ. Uh, and there's a word in the Greek language which means to fill, to fill up, to fulfill, to fill almost to overflowing. So completely filled up. In fact, it can sometimes have the sense of complete. Uh, and that word occurs in a variety of contexts in the New Testament. And we're looking at this as our thread of continuity. This is our theme for these studies these weeks looking at those places that give to us principles of how we can maximize the potential that we have for Jesus Christ. God has given every believer something to work with. Your personality, your abilities and talents, your parentage, your family background, your training, uh, your sense of humor, uh, everything about you, God has designed and he's designed it for you, that's, that's who you are, but it's not just for you. It's not just so that you will feel good about yourself and you will have a happy life and you will, you know, make lots of money and uh, have lots of friends and there's more to it. Uh, the concept is that of stewardship. God has given to us all that we are and all that we have for his glory. To, to do something positive for Christ. And if we're going to fulfill our potential, we're going to have to look at what we have as, I'm a manager of it. It's been given to me to manage to the best of my ability so that I can glorify God, so that I can do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So when we look at it like this, every Christian has the duty to figure out what do I have, and then how am I going to use it to honor the Lord? And so what we've looked at so far, and some of these principles that are on the screen behind me are, are very close in, in content. So number one, we will fulfill our potential only as Christ is in the center of our lives. He's got to be first, he's got to be front and center. If that's not the case, we are never going to live up to our potential. Secondly, we will fulfill our potential for Christ only as we are actively applying God's word to our lives. 
So uh, a key, a core principle of this is I'm going to fulfill what God has given me to do, what he's given me to use of my abilities, my talents, my personality. I'm going to fulfill it as I'm using the Bible and putting it into action in my life. Number three, we will fulfill our potential for Christ only as we follow God's will for our lives, not our own. Uh, when we start saying, I want to do this, and I'm going to do it, we're, we're getting ourselves into trouble. When we surrender our will, and we say, not my will, but thine be done, when we say that, we're on the right track. Number four, and you're going to see there's, there's actually kind of a similarity between two, three, and four, that they're very, very close. Number four, we will fulfill our potential for Christ only as we submit to the authority of God through his word. That sounds a lot like two, and it actually is quite close to number three as well. Here, in principle number four, we're emphasizing the authority part of it. And we're saying, uh, I need to tell God, you're in charge. You run my life. You own me. You're the boss. You're the master. I'm the servant. You tell me what to do. And this is very important to do because the natural man, the, the flesh nature, the old person that we are, and yes, it has been crucified with Christ, and we don't have to listen to it. It has no power over us unless we allow it. But that old nature is every morning getting up and saying, I want to do what I want to do. I want to, I want to make myself the center. Uh, I want to run my life. I want to be the boss and make my own decisions. And every day we're facing the challenge, am I going to submit to the authority of Jesus Christ or am I going to get in the driver's seat? And I, I say to Jesus, hand me the keys. I'm driving here. Give me the keys. And after we've driven at 90 miles an hour towards a brick wall, sometimes we hit it, sometimes we narrowly avoid it. We, we stop, we put it in park, it's okay, I, I messed up, I'm out of line, and we get out, we walk around to the passenger side, we hand the keys to the Lord Jesus, and we say, you're in charge. You drive, but I'm suggesting to you that this is sort of a continuous battle. Uh, this is kind of something that we, we do on a regular basis where we you know, every day or every couple days or every week, we have to get out of the car and realize, what am I doing in the driver's seat? Why am I here? This is not my place. I, I don't belong in the driver's seat. What am I doing? And we have to get out, walk around, give the keys to the Lord Jesus and say, you're the Lord and master. I'm the child and servant. So you make the decisions. So it's, it's a matter of submission. All right. Now today, we're looking at this word, I said it's the word to fill or fulfill, and there are several places in the book of Ephesians where this word occurs. So let me briefly, just by way of introduction, uh, share with you where they are and what they say, and then we're gonna kind of uh, home in on some key contexts, three of them in this book. So in Ephesians chapter one and verse 10, here's the first of them. Uh, it says, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. There's the word fullness. That is a summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. So looking ahead to the future and the summing up, the wrapping up of everything, the fullness of times. And then also in chapter 1, verse 23, referring to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So there's one as a noun, one as a verb. Two times in chapter 1, verse 23. Look in chapter 3 of Ephesians, and verse 19. And to know the love of Christ, Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. And there it is again in two forms, verb and noun, filled up to all the fullness of God. And that's going to be one of the places that we look at more intensively. Chapter 4, look at verse 10, please. He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. There's the word fill. Uh, in chapter 4, verse 13, 
until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature, which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Fullness of Christ. Chapter 5 and verse 18 is the last one. And here's what it says. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Uh, that word filled. So that forms the, the, the content of what we're looking at here. And the first thing that we want to see, and this is point one on your outline, the fullness of God through knowing his love, chapter 3 of Ephesians, and looking there at verse 19. There's a kind of a, a chain reaction or a linked effect passage here, a paragraph starting in verse 14. It's a prayer, and Paul is praying to the Father, and he, he says the, it is the concept of the Father from which every and any family on earth, any legitimate family derives its concepts from the Father. Verse 16, and here's what he's praying, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, verse 17, rooted and grounded in love, verse 18, be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, verse 19, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. So there's a, a long passage here, a long set of connections. And Paul is praying that it would start here and proceed on in kind of a chain reaction. And the end of the chain is at verse 19, to know the love of Christ. Now, it seems self-contradictory here uh, because it says, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. How do you know something that surpasses knowledge? That, that seems self-contradictory. Part of it is in understanding the nature of the word for, uh, for know. And this word has the idea of, of contact with. It, it, it's uh, an intimate knowledge. It's sometimes used in places of a husband knowing his wife. And it has to do with a very intimate, very close contact to know uh, the love of Christ. So there's two things that we can say about this. One is we can say that we know the fact of it. We know the fact of God's love. It is an historical truth. It is an historical reality that God loves us. And I'm saying that is factual. You, you can't deny it. You can't debate it. Why? Why would I say that the love of God is a factual reality? He says so. The Bible says so. And did he just say so, or did he prove it? He proved it. How did he prove it? Romans 5, 8. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrated his love for us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So we know the fact of it, but we also know the experience of it. Uh, have you, and, and, and we're careful because we don't want to live our lives based solely on our experience. We, we don't live our lives based on feelings and emotions, but we do live in, in, in the world. We do have emotions. We do go through experiences in our daily life. Have you ever had the experience of being absolutely at the bottom of a deep, dark pit? and finding there the gracious, loving peace and grace of a loving Heavenly Father. Have you ever had that? Where you were just absolutely at the end of your rope and God reached down and gave you peace, tranquility, joy, and he actually kind of helped you stand on your feet again. Well, there is such a thing as the peace of God. There is such a thing as the joy of God in dark circumstances. There is such a thing as uh, the love of God that reaches down when we are just absolutely wiped out. And so we know the experience of it, not only the fact of it, but the experience of it. So now notice 
in uh, still talking about this, this love, that this love had an effect. Uh, this love did something for us. Uh, we were the recipients of that love. What was the effect on us, the object of love? We're the object of God's love, the object of Christ's love. What was the effect that this love had on us? saved my soul. Uh, it, it got me out of hell. It delivered me from Satan. It, it got me away from death. It, it gave me life. I, I, I can now smile. Uh, I hope that when I die, I have a smile on my face, because I should have. I'm stepping through the doorway into the presence of Jesus Christ. Uh, and it had a profound life-changing, eternity-changing impact on my soul. It had a, an incredible impact on the object of love. You can't think of a more stark contrast between death and life, between slavery and freedom, between hell and heaven. That's the impact. Did it have an impact on the origin of love. Did, it have any, did this love have any sort of an effect on the one who gave the love? Carolyn says yes. So Jesus Christ became flesh. Huh. And uh, for many, many years, I thought, OK, he became a human. And then he lived 33 and a half years. And then he went back to heaven. Now he's not human anymore. But you know, when you read the book of Hebrews and other places, uh, including 1 Timothy, you, you're going to, I think, come to the same conclusion that I did. He's still a man. We have one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. The man. Ah. He's still a human. Well, for how long? Forever. Forever. Uh, there, there are theological implications. We believe that God is omnipresent, right? What does omnipresent mean? Uh, present everywhere, present in all locations. But we were quick to add, we're not pantheists. So a pantheist is somebody who says, well, God is in the grass, and God is in the clouds, and God is in the trees, and God is in the wood, and well, that's a little fruity. You know, that, that's kind of weird. Uh, that would be shamanism. That would be, uh, you know, forms of paganism. Well, no, 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 that's not what we mean. Maybe a little bit better way to, to make it understood would be something like Psalm 139. Whether I go all the way to the east, to the farthest end of the sea, God is there. Or if I go down to the bottom of the ocean, or to the top of the highest mountain, or fly up into the heavens, uh, in other words, God can make his presence felt and be anywhere that he wants to. But we're not saying that God is in the wood. God is separate from his creation. Okay, so God is omnipresent. Is Jesus Christ omnipresent? This is a trick question. Yeah. He, he has apparently somehow limited himself because we're, we're told many times in Scripture, he is not here. He's at the right hand of the Father. He's, he's not here on earth. He's in heaven. Okay. Now, we would certainly add to that Jesus Christ works through the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit dwells within each one of us who are believers. We have the Holy Spirit, and therefore we have the, the working power 
the personality of Jesus Christ at work in us through the Spirit of God. But it looks like Jesus Christ has limited himself to one physical location forever. I'm confident there are more implications of this than we can grasp. But the, the point here is the love of God had an effect on God. There is a cost. There is a sacrifice. The death of Christ, of course, the separation, the, the schism that occurred in the Trinity, that was something, but then this ongoing humanity of Christ, too. So coming back to Ephesians 1, verse 19, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, in order that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. I'd like to suggest to you that if we spend more time meditating on the, the love of Christ, that this is going to help us to be filled up to all the fullness of God. If we spent more time thinking about what it means that Jesus Christ loves me, I'm going to be less inclined to say, I got to have what I got to have. We're going to be less prone to saying, I am the center of the universe. We're going to be less uh, tempted to do our own thing and go our own way. And we'll be filled up with the fullness of God. Go to chapter 4, Ephesians 4. And here's another great paragraph. It's talking about the church and roles of officers in the church, including the earliest uh, in verse 11. He gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors who are teachers. And there's a chronological and a logical progression through that verse. And here's what they're supposed to do. For the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ, verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So there's several things in here that are worth uh, paying attention to. Verse 13, the unity of the faith. And the word faith here has the definite article, the faith. It's calling attention to the body of truth that we believe in. When you see the, uh, in the original language, the faith, it's not just believe in a kind of generic sense. It's saying this is the doctrine that we believe. This is what we hold on to. We put our confidence in the faith. And so this is the, 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 the trust we have, the confidence we have in this doctrine. And there is a unity there. It is to be guarded. Uh, it's also a location. It's where this is. So until we all attain to that, we're moving ahead in that category. Uh, secondly, to a mature man. So there's a couple words here. The word man means an adult, has the idea of adult as opposed to childhood, mature or complete. So I've given you a couple of cross references on the screen. They're not on your sheet, but on the screen. Matthew 5:48. Therefore, you're to be perfect, same word. Doesn't mean sinless, it means complete or grown up as your heavenly Father is perfect. Romans 12, 2, the will of God, that which is good and acceptable and perfect, same word. 1 Corinthians 14, 20, brethren, do not be children in your thinking, yet an evil be infants. What do you think that means? Yet an evil be infants. Not very good at it. You're not very good at it. You don't know much about it. So, you know, there are, there are kinds of sin out there that we don't need to know anything about. There's garbage that happens in the world, and if somebody said, well, it's kind of like, uh, you know, as, as a teenager coming out of a Christian home, you say something, you use some phrase, and somebody giggles, and they say, do you know what that means? Well, no, you know, and they say, well, uh, if you claim to be a Christian, you might not want to use that phrase, because they know what it means, and I don't. Well, that, that's what we're getting at here. So in evil, you don't know what, what that is. In fact, right here in Ephesians, it says there's stuff that goes on out there that we should be ignorant of. 
We don't need to know that stuff. And, and evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. Know how to think. Know how to think godly. Know how to evaluate. Know how to think critically from the right standpoint. Uh, and then in Colossians 1.28, we proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete. I didn't underline it, but it's complete. There's the word in Christ. So mature, fully developed, missing no parts, all the way grown up. That's what this word means. And then the word adulthood or stature here in Ephesians 4.13 uh, is found in these locations, Luke 2.52, great in wisdom and stature. Luke 19, Zacchaeus, he was of little stature or size. John 9.21 and 23, the, the man who was born blind, he is of age. He's, he's fully grown. Hebrews 11.11, 11, she was past age, Sarah. So fully developed stature, maturity. What does it mean here when it says in Ephesians 4.13 that our goal, where we're going, is this mature man, the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. What does the fullness of Christ mean? Well, it's going to mean the imprint of his character. It's going to mean that we're stamped with who he is and what he is. Things like his holiness, his goodness, his love, and the fullness of his personality. Uh, power, strength, faithfulness. There'd be other attributes that we could say, but that stamp of who Jesus Christ is gets imprinted on us. The fullness of Christ. All right, let's go to the third one. And I think we have enough time to do this. Go to Ephesians 5.18. Here's a passage that uh, is, is often misunderstood, and so we're going to take a few minutes to walk through this. This is the, the last occurrence of this uh, word, fullness, filling, completeness, in Ephesians. Ephesians 5, 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So... Um, you are aware that there are brands of Christianity that are going to say that you need to have the Holy Spirit fill you and refill you. So they're going to make a distinction between receiving the Holy Spirit at salvation and then an experience, something that happens to you on an ongoing basis of you, you can get filled and then you can empty it. And you can get filled and get emptied. And we're going we're gonna to look at that for a minute and see what, what this verse says. So let me give you a very brief grammar lesson. And there will not be a quiz, so you don't need to worry about pronouncing it correctly. Or, uh, but, but this is going to be helpful to see what is going on in the text. So the wording here in the middle of the verse, verse 18, but be filled with the Spirit. Uh, the word but is in Greek the word Allah. Allah. Uh, the word for be filled is the word plerusta, and then in spirit is ennumity. So Allah, plerusta, ennumity. And the word ba, the, that word Allah, is a very strong, it's the strongest possible disjunctive. So you say one thing, and then you say, but, on the other hand, over here. So this is a very powerful contrast. Uh, what he's about to say has nothing to do with getting drunk with wine. It's, it's the opposite. So don't get drunk with wine, but be filled. And then when we come to the verb, it's translated here in the New American Standard uh, in verse 18, but be filled. Uh, if you're a grammarian, you might recognize that that is a passive voice in English. It's happening to you. So something is happening to you. Uh, if I were to take the, the verb fill uh, and turn it into active, it would be something like, I am filling the jug. I fill the jug. So I've got a water bucket, and I'm filling a jug. I'm doing the action. But the way it's translated here, I am being filled by 
something else. However, that may not be the best way to translate this. Furthermore, the, the noun, but be filled with the spirit. Now, obviously, when we see it and New American Standard has, is trying to be helpful and they have capitalized, they put a capital S, the spirit. In the original Greek manuscripts, they didn't have capitals. There is no such thing as capital letters or lowercase. They're all the same. Uh, and in this case, it doesn't have the word the. So if we were to make this a little bit better translation, it would be something like this. And do not be drunk by means of wine, in which is dissipation, but rather fill yourselves in spirit. Probably a better reading of the verb is what we call middle voice. It's an action that you do to yourself. Huh? Well, did I help or did I make it more complicated? What does this even mean? Well, if we put it like this, this is not, I get more of the Holy Spirit. This, this is not, in fact, we would say, based on our studies in the book of Acts and in the epistles, when you trusted Jesus Christ, you received the Holy Spirit, and you got all of him that you're ever going to get. You don't ever lose part of him, and you don't ever get more of him. So you have the Holy Spirit, period, full stop. But there is such a thing as walking with the Spirit or living in the Spirit. So what are some things that we could say about this? Well, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but there is a parallel passage to this whole paragraph in Ephesians 5, and it's Colossians 3. And I'll, I'll just call your attention to 3.16. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. There's a connection, and, and the connection is the Word of Christ, the truths of the Bible, the Word of God is going to have an impact in this area. But I really want to turn to Galatians 5.16. Go to Galatians 5.16. And this is getting kind of to the crux, to the, to the core of the question, the core of the matter about this matter of, of being filled in the realm of spiritual things. And it, here's Galatians 5, 16. Here's what it says. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. There is a great contrast. In fact, there's a great war, a battle going on between flesh and spirit. And if you've been saved for more than 10 minutes, you know what I'm talking about. The old nature would like to do what it would like to do. It is all about itself. It is all about gratification. It's all about, I want what I want. The new nature, the, 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 the nature that is supposed to be being controlled by the Spirit of God, wants to glorify Jesus Christ, wants to honor him, wants to be holy, uh, wants to be fruitful. But there is this conflict. There is this issue that's going on. So let me take you to one other passage. And it's, uh, I didn't put it on the sheet, and it's not on the screen. But Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And here you're going to see some things uh, in a dynamic that is very, very helpful because it can kind of cut through the confusion and the chaos. Romans, the eighth chapter, and I'm looking uh, at verse 3. 8, 3 of Romans. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an, as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh 
so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So there you see, we're not walking according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And uh, interestingly, in that verse, the word the does not occur in the original between, before flesh or spirit. Fleshly, spiritual. Verse five, for those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mindset in the flesh is death, but the mindset in the spirit is life and peace, because the mindset in the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse six is enormously helpful. Here's what it says, for the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. So I'm gonna have you look at the bottom of the screen first. Uh, and this is uh, on the bottom of your sheet. Much of the Christian's life and spiritual maturity can be summarized in a single simple question. And it's this, does this thing promote the flesh or the spirit? So you're thinking about buying something or you're thinking about watching a particular television show or you're thinking about spending some time with a certain individual, or you're thinking about engaging in a certain activity, wh whatever it is. And a key question to ask would be, this desire that I have to do this, does this come from flesh or spirit? I is it going to make me more spiritual? Am I gonna be more in tune with the Lord? Am I gonna be more obedient to his word? as a result of doing this thing or buying this thing or spending this time on this activity, am I going to be better equipped to love Jesus Christ and serve him? Or is it just what I want to do? <laughs> and if it's just what I want to do, then there's an excellent chance that they, the idea for that, the desire for that is from the flesh and it's going to promote the flesh. And this can be extremely helpful to us in evaluating how do, I, how do I want to spend my time? How do I want to spend my money? What are my priorities in life? There is such a thing as a fleshly, or a, a synonymous word is carnal, fleshly or carnal mind. And it's all about self, it's all about gratifying myself, it's all about getting what I want, it's all about ma making myself the center of my own little universe, it's all about other people need to agree with me because I'm the center, it's all about uh, God exists to make me happy. Well, you, you can see how twisted up this gets. And actually, Paul says here, the mind that is set on the flesh, it may feel good, it may feel like gratification, but what is it actually? Death, it's death. And you say, well, well how can that be? Because it feels good, I like it. I, I like uh, you know, whatever this is that I'm, I'm doing or I'm eating or I'm spending money on or spending time with this person. If it feels so good, how can it be death? And the answer is, it may not be immediate, immediately apparent. But the book of James tells us this, there is an anatomy or there's an epidemiology of sin and it starts with a desire. And then you agree to go along with the desire and when that lust has conceived, it brings forth sin and sin when it has fully developed brings forth, how does it go? Death. And every one of us in, the, in this room, I'm sure, has experienced, you think, I'm just gonna do this. And, and you try not to think about what is God saying about this. You try not to think about what does Jesus think about this. You try not to think about that because that would be like guilty, you know. So you just shunt that off to the side and say, I'm just gonna do it. And then you do it and, oh, it's wonderful. It's fun, it's, it's good, it's whatever it is. 
And then about an hour later, you think to yourself, what an absolute idiot I am. What did I just do? What a fool. I am such an idiot. Why would I do that? So I had pleasure for 15 minutes, or I, I spent money that I should not have spent on something that I didn't need, and I got it. And for the, the 10 minutes that I had this new thing in my hand, oh, this is great, this is what I always wanted. And an hour later, what did I do? Why did I do that? that, that that's, that's death, that's disappointment, that's regret. The mind that is set on spirit is joy and peace. So, in closing out, here are some things that we have learned today from fullness in the book of Ephesians. First of all, meditating on the love of God will promote being filled with the fullness of Christ. The more we think about the love of God, the love of Jesus Christ, the impact that had on the Trinity, the impact it has had on my life, the more I think about that, the more I meditate on that, the more that I will be filled with the fullness of Christ. Secondly, spiritual maturing is a process of growing a relationship with Christ and a growing resemblance to Christ. Out of chapter 4, we come to resemble the, the fullness, the, the maturity, the full-grown man of adulthood in Christianity, and that is the same thing as growing to, to resemble Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, much of fulfilling our potential for Christ can be practically summarized with a single question, does this thing promote the flesh or the spirit? Questions, comments? Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for time together in the word today. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and for the joy that we find in our relationship to him. Oh Lord, we pray that we would be fulfilling our potential for him, that we would be focused upon your love for us upon growing to resemble Jesus more and more, and upon having a mind that is focused on uh, spiritual things. So, Father, grant to us victory. And now we pray your blessing upon the morning service and all the activities of the day. We commit uh, all the remaining details of the day into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen.